Welcome to Mimosa Sisterhood, a podcast that celebrates women. Hello, friends. Welcome back to the podcast. This is Melissa, and you are listening to a novel adaptation. That's right, guys. No Mimosa Sisterhood here for you today. You are going to be hearing my episode feature on a novel adaptation podcast, which is hosted by Jordan and M. And it's a show that talks about book to movie adaptations and what it takes to make a screen adaptation that not only stays true to the book, but takes it to the next level. We've all heard the saying that the book is always way better than the movie, but is that always the case? Jordan and M are your girls that can answer that question for you. So be sure to check out a novel adaptation podcast. There are so many episodes of incredible book to movie adaptation conversations. They just launched season three and my episode feature is the first of season three. So very excited to have been invited on the show. You know, I'm obsessed with Jordan. She is a reoccurring guest host on Mimosa Sisterhood podcast. And when she invited me on and said that I had the power to pick the book and the movie, I was like, oh, hell yes. What are we going to be talking about? And leave it to me to find the perfect book and movie that relate back to the love and joy and sisterhood that we thrive for on Mimosa Sisterhood podcast. So it took me all of 25 seconds to figure out which book and movie I was going to select because... I just kicked it back in gear to 1999 and selected my favorite movie when I was a youngin. And that, my friends, was Girl Interrupted. Can I get a hoo hoo hoo? Who did not love that movie? I mean, if you are my age in your 30s, I imagine you've seen it and you probably loved it as much as I did. But have you read the book? Because I never did. So I was in for a real surprise when I finally picked up the 1993 memoir written by Susanna Kaysen, which depicts her real life experience in a psychiatric ward during her young teen years in the 1960s. If you didn't know, Girl Interrupted, the movie is a true story that's based off Susanna Kaysen's memoir. But it is a lot prettier, shinier, bubblier, and cleaner than the truth of the memoir of Susanna Kaysen's life. So tune in today to hear all about this book-to-movie adaptation and to hear this lovely conversation that I have with Jordan and M on their podcast. Enjoy this bonus episode, and I will see you next week back for Mimosa Sisterhood shit. Welcome back, lovely listeners. Uh, We hope this podcast finds you well. I cringe as I say it, but really, we do. Um, We're excited to be back and even more excited that we are kicking off our new season with a very special guest. Yay! Uh, We'd like to welcome to a novel adaptation, Melissa Herrera from Mimosa Sisterhood Podcast. Hi, Melissa! Welcome, Hi! Melissa. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited. I've been waiting for this for months, and I am just so excited to be here. So thank you. Yeah. Um, Yay! So fun fact, listeners, uh, Melissa has this amazing podcast called Mimosa Sisterhood. I've guest starred on it a couple of times, going on my third. And uh, I invited Melissa the first time I guest starred, going, Melissa, you got to come on ours. And then, like, it just never happened. And then the second time I was like, no, really, Melissa, you got to come on ours. So (laughs) she's here. We're happy to have her. And it's really excited. And per our tradition of uh, of guest stars, our guest gets to pick the adaptation that we're covering. So, Melissa, what are we reading and covering today? We are reading and watching Girl Interrupted, which was written by Susanna Kaysen. And if anybody is unfamiliar with the book or the movie, 
Girl Interrupted is an autobiographical memoir published in 1993, where Susanna Kaysen recounts her time at McLean Hospital in Belmont, Massachusetts, which occurred in 1967 after she overdosed on pills. I believe it was Advil. Aspirin. Yeah. Maybe it was aspirin. I think it was a- aspirin. Aspirin. One yeah. of the one of the A's. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and uh, throughout the novel, we are introduced to many of the women who were also in the ward with Susanna while she was there for, I believe, two full years. So I feel like I should preface by saying to both of you, I apologize for picking such a gnarly ass book. <laughs> <laughs> I will say I had seen the movie when I was in high school, which was at some point between the time period of 2003 to 2007. And I was very emo during Mm. this time period in all the feels, in all the anger. The teenage angst was real. The angst was just like flowing through my veins on a daily basis. I loved this movie. Like, I loved every single thing about this movie. And that's alarming. As a 32-year-old woman looking back and being like, this was my favorite movie in high school, that's a little terrifying. Uh -uh. But I will say, (laughs) when I read the book, I was very, like, surprised of, in my personal perspective, it was much more, like, dark and a little traumatizing than the movie came off. So oh, I, as I'm yeah. reading it, as I'm reading it, I'm like, oh my God, I'm such an asshole. <laughs> like, no. I mean, Melissa, like, <laughs> I've, I've never, I've never read the book and I never watched the movie, but I knew like that movie spoke to a lot of girls that I knew. And I, it was a thing because yeah, the movie came out in what, 1999 and it starred Angelina mm-hmm. Jolie and um, Winona Ryder, like all the bigs, like the talent in this movie, first of all, is just mm-hmm. Brittany Murphy. Yeah. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg, Elizabeth Moss, like baby Elizabeth yes, Moss. Baby Elizabeth Moss. Oh, I don't know. Dude, I, I didn't know. I mean, obviously back then I didn't know who she was. Then I saw all of Mad Men and Handmaid's Tale. And then I was like, oh, my God, Elizabeth Moss is in this movie. Yes, she is. Right. right. Oh. Yeah. So, so, uh, so yeah, so basically I picked this book because I love this movie so much. It resonated with me so strongly when I was a young teenager, which was around the time that Susanna was admitted to the hospital. She was 18 years old following high school where she was having one of those times in her life, like many of us did, where she was very confused about who she was and why she was here and what to do next, which I also felt. So I feel like that's why the oh, movie yeah. was so like called to me but the book was very dark (laughs) and I'm just like oh my god so we have a lot to talk about because I mean we will unpack it yeah sneak preview the movie wasn't nearly as as harsh as the book was (laughs) Um, Emily did you ever read it or watch it before our time together today no, I hadn't. And I'm so glad you picked this one because I remember seeing that, seeing it come out in theaters and thinking, I really want to see that. And it was never something that like anybody else wanted to see around me. And I was just like, oh, it's fine. I'll just, I'll get to it. I'll get to it someday. And this is, it's so intense. I'm not going to say it's as intense as like, I'm thinking of ending things, which was <laughs> a mind fuck. Oh, but shit. like, it does have its dark moments and I kind of loved it. There's also a lot in this book and in the movie that I'm like, wait, do people grow out of some of these things? Oh, no. When you relate to the character who has mental illnesses, it's like, oh, great. Cool. I'm going to talk about that in therapy next week. Yep. Totally. (laughs) I mean, you know, it's fine. Jordan, have you seen it? Nope. Never saw it. Never read it. But I just knew of it. Um, Actually... I knew the movie, like I said, uh, everybody, every girl in high school was like, I relate to this. And I was like, I was, I was not quite emo. I like was half emo, like simple plan emo, not Linkin Park emo, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I'm going to date myself here. All right. Yeah. So like I, 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 and I never had any friends who watched it. I just knew it like resonated with people. And as I'm watching it now, I was like, oh, I get it. I get it. Like, no, mm-hmm. this, and it even speaks to me as an adult, which, you know, I'll unpack later. Like, uh, just Angelina Jolie's performance as Lisa the entire, like the entire time. I was like going, 
is Lisa a sociopath? Yeah. Do do I like you know not 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 disagree with it with stuff that she says? I mean, she's, she's, she she kind of has a point. She kind of says a lot of things that are like true. Um. Yeah. So yeah. like yeah. <laughs> anyway, we'll get into that. But <laughs> Emily, what are we drinking today? Yeah, before we get into all this, I know I'm going to need a drink, so Mm. it's not super intense on the alcohol, but you're going to want it. It's from Death and Company Cocktail Book, and it's called The Pink Elephant, which, star-studded choice. Well done, Jordan. The Pink Elephant. (laughs) Yes, it's very good. This is just two ounces of gin. You have a little bit of maraschino liqueur, some creme de mur, which is blackberry liqueur, Mm. grapefruit juice, lime juice, and simple syrup. So it's all shaken together, and then you strain it into a coop. And it's so refreshing and delightful and just fruity, and you can pour heavy on the gin. It's fine. No garnish either. You don't have to... We've got pink elephants to see, huffalumps and woozles to play with. We don't need any garnish, okay? (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. We are the garnish here. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, so, um, with everyone listening here, we're prescribing to you one dose of spoilers and 45 minutes of discussion. So strap in folks. We're going to be spoiling everything, everything, everything. I have to say, I can't think of anyone else I would have cast in any of these roles. Like, I know that we've already gushed about them, but like Angelina Jolie was just hitting her stride with all of her movies and Winona Ryder with those big eyes that are just so... Like, she looks innocent, but she also plays that very knowing smile very well. I don't know. She's great. I loved both of them as the main characters, and I wouldn't have changed a thing. Yeah, 90s Winona Ryder, like, in her, uh, you know, element of uh, not sure who she is and kind of an outcast, but everyone still relates to her, like Lydia from from Beetlejuice. Oh, no. Yeah, Beetlejuice. And... Yes! uh, I just recently watched Edward Scissorhands again, and like, yeah, Ooh, love I, it. Yeah, so she that this was her element. This was her time, and damn, did she shine! Also, Brittany Murphy, um, <gasps> all yeah. hail, all hail, Brittany Murphy. I miss Brittany Murphy so much. I know. R.A.P. Brittany Murphy. Yes. Was that Claire Danes as Georgina? Georgiana? No, no, no that what? was um Claire Duval. Claire Duval. Claire Duval. Yes. Thank you. I yes. was like, it's. It, Claire Dane's light? No, I'm <laughs> no, uh, totally different. <laughs> but totally no, yeah, different. Uh, you know what? And honestly, uh, I, and this is a shameful uh, on my part. It's like I didn't really pay attention to Claire Duval until the last few years. Like I, mm. she was never on my radar. Like I saw her and stuff, but I didn't realize, recognize how talented she was and how funny she was because, like, watching her in Veep, and then also the fact that she wrote my favorite Christmas movie. That came out last year, like for the 20, uh, 2020 Christmas season. Um, yeah, just she wrote and produced that and directed it. And it was Chef's Kiss. Beautiful. What movie. was that movie? It, I think it's called Happiest Season. It's with. Uh, oh, yeah. With oh, Kristen Stewart. Good. Yeah. I was just thinking of that. So yeah. I also couldn't think of anybody I'd cast like. Like, in this time period, like, no other actresses came to mind within this time period of which the movie was filmed. But I was thinking of, like, if we were to refilm it today, there were two people that came to mind. And I'm only bringing this up because you just mentioned her. I thought Kristen Stewart would have played, like, a pretty good Susanna Kaysen. Yeah. Like, I'm just, like, thinking back on who she was in Twilight. <laughs> Like, you know her, like, weird character in Twilight? Yeah. Like, oh. I feel like she could have kind of, like, pulled off this role pretty well. And then I thought of a Lisa, and I was thinking Lisa could easily be played by Margot Robbie. Oh, like, yeah. Like, especially having seen her as, what was it, Harley Quinn? Harley Quinn. Oh, yeah. Tanya yes. Harding also. She yeah, plays Tanya Harding, so well. Right? Yeah. She uh-huh. does. And she also has these like kind of big eyes. And uh, I feel like she could do the Lisa role pretty well. Maybe not as, you know, great as Angelina. But I think if it were to be filmed today, like that could could work. I could oh. see that. I could also see Natasha Leone in that. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh my, my God. God. She would be amazing in that. She yes. her, she's got those eyes that are just like borderline she, a little bit on the like 
yep. don't know what she's going to do next. <laughs> kind so, of thing. So yes. who would Natasha Leone be then? Like, we've got Lisa and we've got Susanna. Oh, I mean, I, I, I would have put her as Lisa. But you know what? Oh, yeah. She could also be fun as a... I don't want to call her Torch. Her name is Polly. Polly. <laughs> and take like a twisted version of it. Just like she has the face that doesn't always look innocent, but she plays it as innocent. Mm. Oh my God. So there's a male and female character that were missing from the movie that were in the book that I was not pleased about. Please do tell I'm us. talking about, for the male, Georgina's rage-induced boyfriend. Oh, yeah. Where was he at? I was really looking forward to meeting him in the movie. Whose dad was in the CIA? Wasn't he a patient to cross? Like, he was another patient, but just in the men's ward, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, like, there was, like, a whole chapter on this guy in the book, and then he wasn't in the movie, and I feel like they, like, made a good point about, like, all these lies that he was apparently telling them they were then, like, learning about in real time in the news, like, actually in the world and you're like what the fuck is going on is he a liar is he not a liar but then also at, in terms of the female character that was missing from the movie that was in the book the girl that was dating the alien who had the penis oh, uh, for yeah. whatever reason that that character is escaping me <laughs> Well, it was so weird and disturbing that I wouldn't be surprised if you just blocked it out of your mind. Probably, it like, got brought up like a couple of times, and like I had to keep rereading the sentences because I'm like, am I reading this wrong? What is happening? But there was a character that said she had, she was the girlfriend of an alien, and she had a penis, and she would be running around trying to show people her penis. Which, wasn't it just her clit? Like, it was just, she was just showing people, just, like, look at this. And it's like, honey, that's just part of your anatomy. I don't know, maybe she didn't. This this book was sometimes hard to follow. <laughs> it was. Especially, Honestly, it jumped back and forth. Like, was this a daydream? Was this a flashback? Or is this in real time? I wasn't always sure. Well, that's well, also the thing. It's like, Susanna, like, I'm not sure when she wrote it, which is why I put in the description that it was published in 1993. Like, this happened in the 60s. And this uh -huh. woman is now publishing her memoir in, like, yeah, she's writing it probably throughout between that time, but doesn't publish. And so you've got memories, years that have just like, here are just the main points that I've pulled out, like what I, what like stand out to me. So of course, I, I actually dug it. I liked it a lot. And one thing that I really loved about the book um, that I didn't feel like the movie quite captured. I mean, the movie and the book kind of had their own separate tones, which on their own, perfect, great. But the one thing I loved about the book is, like, it, it, it was highlighting to me one of the things that isn't really brought up and especially not really talked about much in the, in the movie was that you've got all these women with real mental problems. Or, in my case with Susanna, even though she did try to commit suicide, she was diagnosed with, what, uh, uh, borderline personality Borderline, disorder. which to this day is still, like, not properly defined. Like, nobody has a direct, like... Um, definition of what that means and so in the first in the first chapter she's like yeah I met with a doctor I spoke with him for 15 minutes and then he diagnosed me and sent me to a mental hospital and it's like going, and there's the biggest problem right there you've got women in the 60s who were odd who were disruptive to their families or who were just in the way and then got shipped off to a mental hospital and the way that she wrote that like even with the characters who did have real problems like Polly and like Lisa and everyone it was very matter of fact, like this was fucked up, but this is the way it was. Kind of like how Deborah Feldman did with Unorthodox. This is kind of fucked up, but this was the way it was. And I appreciated that narrative. Like I just, it wasn't dramatic. It wasn't boo-hoo me. It was just, yeah, I lived it. This is how, this is how it went. Just laying out the facts yeah, of what is... happened during her stay. It's just literally a slice of her life. Like just, this is how it went down. And that's, it did give it a really interesting flavor because you were able to draw so many of your own conclusions. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think she did a little bit of leading into uh, that the system is the problem and not necessarily like but that there was it? a big bad. Yeah, there, there, yeah, there was like, um, it is a problem. And I, I think the, the movie kind of took it along lines of, I guess, highlighting mental illness and how it needs to be yeah. addressed, especially with therapy. Like it was very pro therapy, which I was like, yes, in 1999, 
Go movie. What up? Yeah. Um, but also you have Lisa who was only like, wasn't even really a big part. She never stuck out to me in the book. Really. She was baby, pretty much mentioned in passing a lot. Like never really, she wasn't a thing. As big of a thing I as thought she was, she was big. Like we had that entire chapter where it was original Lisa, Lisa, original flavor. And right. the new Lisa. <laughs> Yes. who was called, what was it, Lisa Cody? And she was constantly yes. just like, oh, she has to have her last name because she's not the Lisa. Yeah. Right, but but this Lisa in the movie was, she's supposed to be the villain, right? And she yes. had like a way bigger part. It was kind of um, enhanced as the villain. But what was really interesting to me too is like, again, as I said, uh, yeah, Lisa was a sociopath. She did a lot of things that were uh, bad, but also... She was just being blunt to people, which is probably what got her thrown in to begin with. She was a woman who was just blunt to people and said, look, this is how it is. This is what's happened. And her family kind of threw her away there. Um, and yeah, the movie just kind of inflated her to be more of a villain than I think she was actually supposed to. I don't know. Uh, also, when people were commenting, I was reading an article with Angelina Jolie um, and her role because everyone was like, Angelina, you did so great. Like, how, what did it feel like to play crazy? And she was like, oh, I never thought of myself as crazy while I was playing Lisa. Like, I never thought of Lisa as crazy. Mm -hmm. I was like, exactly. I was watching it, and I never thought of Lisa as crazy. She had problems, but she wasn't crazy. Well, there were a few times I saw that she had less tact than, I think, uh, a person right? of normal moral character. True. Like, usual. But other than that, like, yeah, I wouldn't say crazy either. So I have like 3,000 things to say. <laughs> Please. But to like piggyback on the Lisa, mm -hmm. I agree with you, Jordan. And I feel like one good thing to back up that, like what you've said and me agreeing to it, is in the book, which I'm so bummed they didn't have this happen in the movie because I was really wanting to see it. But at the end of the book, she runs into Lisa later in her life. And Lisa's out of the hospital. She yes, has a child. With her kid. She's a religious woman who is living a suburban life, going to church, saying, oh, you know, everything changed for me once I had this kid and we go to church because it feels right. S people who are sociopaths, can they, can you switch the flip like that? All of a sudden be this great mom who's like a wonderful family lady and like taking your kid to church she did what she had to do to survive i'm sorry like <laughs> like i get it i she's maybe. a sociopath yes yes maybe but i don't think the sociopath would be able to care for a small child and be able to like love them i think lisa in the book was just meant to be like yeah just loud and obnoxious yeah you're right you're right the movie amplified what could have been yes and i there are some things that i'm like pissed about about that that i'll talk about later but i also wanted to piggyback off on this topic of what we first started about with therapy and women being admitted to hospitals during this time period and how easy it was just be thrown in this hospital and be called crazy but on top of that in the book and in the movie we saw numerous times how lackluster these therapists were I mean, half in the book, they, they literally made a joke out of them that mm -hmm. when it was time for the patients to go see their therapist, it was the therapist like scheduled time to take a nap or like they, they would sh like everybody knew like therapy wasn't going to be happening. Like maybe some people did go, but most didn't. And like no one pushed it on them. And then in the movie, we see him, the therapist like snoring while Susanna's like talking on the couch. Yeah. Yeah. And so... Uh, the idea that in this time period, women were so easily being thrown in psych wards, being told they were mentally ill, to then receive a this kind of treatment where their therapist, like, is taking a nap and, like, fucking, you know, fucking playing solitaire on his computer. Like, yeah. it was such a joke what we saw. It was such a joke. I mean, the only people that we really witnessed doing their jobs were the actual, like, nurses and staff that were managing the patients like every day all day long non-stop but we didn't really see that much from like these higher level psychiatrists that really should have been the people that were focused on like helping these women with whatever issues that they were dealing with mentally yeah, yeah. so what's the irony in that like how that is the craziest thing about it and like freaks me go like 
wow, so women are just being thrown in mental institutions, but, like, no one's actually, like, it's a big joke to everybody to even throw them in and then not even give them treatment. Yeah, well, don't forget, exactly. there were there were lobotomies and electroshock therapy, too. So if you just needed a quick and easy, and that the movie didn't really, like, they said, oh, she already went in for electroshock once or twice, and that was it. Like, they didn't bring, like, uh, yeah. They didn't. It wasn't as, no, they could have definitely included more of the, like, severe, aggressive treatments that were being used. I remember in the book reading about, like, being wrapped in cold blankets or something. Like, Like, so much stuff, like, fucked up things that, like, torture. Like, these people are being tortured. Yep. Until they got to the point where they were acceptable to the society, which is Uh, air quotes here. Or how they make... They make fun of the patients who they call, I don't remember what term they were calling them, but the people that were watching TV and were just like zonked and like, you know, oh, they'd yeah. blow smoke in their oh, faces yeah. and they wouldn't oh. even react. They like mm-hmm. had like a joke name for them. I don't remember what it was. The depressives but, like, or like They were the... just completely yeah. blitzed to the point that they were just staring at walls. Zombies or something. Yeah. They just weren't responding. So yeah, the movie like didn't heavily go into the severity of the torture that these women were being put through. But one thing that like really like bothered me (laughs) about the movie, I like almost felt like I was getting defensive for these real women. Like they aren't characters, you know, like this isn't a a fable. We didn't just like make this story up and like create names for random characters and spell out this, these this was wild, someone's life this these were real human beings mm-hmm. and the book is the you know bio- autobiography written by one of the patients that knew these people and could accurately say word for word this is what we went through but there were things in the movie that were completely not in the book that were i believe made up but were reflective of real women And so what I'm fucking pissed about is the movie depicting Lisa as a villain to the point that she was the cause of Daisy's suicide. Like, they literally said in the movie, they go to her house, she fucking rips her a new one and makes fun of her, and then the next that, morning she's hanging and dead, and that, that was... literally never happened. <laughs> like, well, well, that but, did not happen. Well, yeah, well, Daisy did die. She did kill yeah, herself, yes. but that was, like, happened off book, and they just heard about it later in the hospital, like, going, yeah, and then we what? found out Daisy yes. killed herself, and we were really sad and really bummed because we liked Daisy. Like, that was it. Yeah, we, like, the nurse came and gathered us all up and said, oh my god, I have horrible news, Daisy. Daisy, one of the patients here, has now ended her life. We're so upset about it. Let's mourn. The girls didn't break out of the mental institution, hightail it in some hippie van to Daisy's house, <laughs> rip her a fucking new one, and say all these horrible things to her, and then find her dead body the next morning. Like, that didn't happen in the real world, as far as we know, per Susanna Kaysen's autobiography. But, no, like, are we allowed to make horrific claims like that? Like, is can Lisa sue these people? Like I don't understand. <laughs> like if that was me, I would be like, "Fuck you for make, making it seem like I was the cause of Daisy's suicide." Like that is so fucking right? rude and horrible. Like Lisa's a real person, and now she's this villain that like basically caused somebody to die. Yeah. And that's the biggest change between the book and the movie was that they had to create the villain they had to turn lisa into the villain so that there was a story arc so that you could see susanna growing without her and like turning into Mm -hmm. the person she wanted to be and i'm like that sounds like the same 60s bullshit that like they all wanted her to get better in the 60s but they didn't really want her to get better they wanted her to conform to what they had as an idea for her so this was the same thing she was just conforming to the idea Lisa wasn't a villain? I don't know. This this whole thing, like, they had to dramatize so much to even make it into movie-worthy, you right. know? Right, mm-hmm. because the book, it was just all, like, character study. Not, not even character studies. It was just one woman's um, description this of how she happened. lived with these girls. That was yeah. it. And, and like, and apparently that doesn't play well. Or it's not dramatic enough. That's what it is. It's not dramatic oh, enough for so a dramatic. film. So we have to, like, really vamp it up. And, of course, there has to be... Lisa, who's just like the worst. But even then, like even when that, even like, I hated the Daisy part. Like that was the point where I was just like, okay, come on, that that was like, it was so terrible. That that didn't need to happen. And that song 
uh, can you ever get that song out of your head ever again? <laughs> like, God. the minute I heard it again in the movie, I had flashbacks to me being in high school and remember hearing that song at this scene and being like, <sighs> oh my God, no, oh. don't let this song back into my head. Yeah. And now you'll never hear it the same again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, it was just, it wasn't worthwhile. But uh, can I tell you one scene that I really, really loved? Like, just almost had a moment. And this is another where I think that a lot of girls especially just kind of clung to this movie because it was also one of the few movies in that t- in that era, that time, when, like, you had, it was a movie about women. And it definitely passed the Bechdel test because it was women talking about themselves and each other and no men. And they were just trying to get better or not get better or whatever. Um, But there was that one scene where Polly is like having her meltdown, right? And she's locked in her room Mm -hmm. and she's crying and her and Lisa sit outside the door and play the guitar um, to her mm-hmm. and sing all night. And then when the nurses try to move them the next morning, Lisa, like, gets up in arms, like, oh, we're trying to help Paula. You guys aren't doing jack shit for her. Mm-hmm. We're just trying to make her better, like, make her feel better. And that's where I was just like, when, see, that's, that's the Lisa I believe more rather than the Lisa that, you know, Daisy, your dad fucks you. We all know it. Oh, my God. It's like, I know. God. Yeah. So they, yeah, they, there were so many times when they took an idea like a figment of the character or the individual that's portrayed in the book and then they just ramp it up to 11 and sometimes that goes beyond what is actually the character of that person in the book so it's just Mm -hmm. it made it it made it way less believable i can understand why young girls and teenagers find it so appealing Mm -hmm. (laughs) because you know having those intense emotions and trying to figure out how to deal with them Sure, that's really hard. And seeing other people struggle with it too, like some kind of comfort. But yeah, no, I didn't see Lisa as that person at all. I saw Lisa as the one who sits down and tries to help out her you know. <laughs> her friends and try and like help them with she the talks, kitty. She, yeah, she talks to the other girl, some of the other girls with the kitty puppet. Hello. <laughs> that's what I was like. When I first saw her do that, I was like, Lisa, hi, girl. Like, Mm -hmm. She was an instigator and she like started stuff, but she started things that were necessary, like that were going to help everyone emotionally. In the book, she was so much more of a like leader, a leader by example too, not just giving directives and being shitty. And again, Mm -hmm. like, like aren't, aren't some, isn't there, wasn't there like a study that most of the CEOs in the world are sociopaths anyway so it's like yeah all these like a lot of leaders <laughs> tend to be sociopaths and vice you know and being a sociopath doesn't necessarily mean you're evil i mean you lack some emotional <laughs> uh, yeah. emotion but like you're not going to do it you might not probably won't do anything very sinister with it you know just you're just gonna go on your you're gonna go on with your life regardless of what other people think about you and what uh you think about other people Sociop- mm-hmm. so- sociopathy i don't know so yeah and i also think like in response to the the part of the movie that you brought up where they were singing to polly like i think that's why in high school i loved this movie which i'll say i didn't find as reflective in the book but i felt like in the movie it showed a bunch of young girls very troubled some more than others, going through severe hardships, who were alone in this hospital, being tortured and medicated on a day-to-day basis. And they had, like, each other to get through. And so, like, that sisterhood really came out in the movie of, like, they hated each other, but they loved each other. And, like, they wanted to fight, but they also would, like, kill, you know, die for each other. So, like, there was such, like, a strong, like, pact in that, like, they understood each other's trauma because they were all going through it together and they would do anything to help each other i didn't see that as much in the book however i don't know that that maybe like that wasn't there i feel like the book was like less it was more of just like describing people and things but there was less about like bond friendship like connection at least i didn't like feel it as much um but I, I mean, and again, I don't, I don't know if there was or wasn't, but I think that, like, 
because that was so heavily kind of portrayed in the movie, it really called to someone like me in high school who was fucking angry and upset and going through all this shit and thinking like, yes, there are other women that go through shit and are angry and upset too. And like, if I did end up this way one day, at least I know there's other girls there just like me who would accept me and hug me and bring me in with open arms. That sister that you've been, yeah, with no expectations from society out well. Yeah. No, they, and yeah. and they and like no one cared what, what anybody else's issue was. They didn't yeah. care what you did, how you got there, what shit you were doing while you were there. Like e- even the way they talk about sex, I found hysterical. You know, like it, think about in the movie when they're at the ice cream shop and that woman approaches Susanna oh. and she's like you know, fuck you, Susanna, I found out you had an affair with my husband, and they're all laughing and saying, like, yeah, she gave your husband a rim job, so what? What are you going to do about it? And like, oh. it was just such a chaos, you know? Beautiful, but yeah. I just feel like there was no judgment ever. Like, there was nothing any of those girls could have done or, like, had happened to them that would have, anybody would have even blinked an eye over. It was it, just like, I mean, even with Daisy and her weird chickens that she was hiding, like, sure, they made fun of her, but oh like, God, yeah. yeah, I the, mean, the, the, the chickens with Daisy and then also the other anorexic girl on the floor, like Lisa, mm. like she would say something to Lisa and Lisa would go fatty. <laughs> it was just like, like, like harsh. But it was like, yeah. We, the, everyone knew what she was there everyone for. Everyone was exposed. Yeah, everyone was there exposed. There was no like, hiding anything. <laughs> and, like, I feel like, sure, they made fun of each other, but, like, no one was, like, really ostracized. I feel like in the end, they were all close-knit. At least mm-hmm. that's how I felt in the movie. No, it definitely, that definitely came through. For sure. And especially at, you know, at the beginning, at the very first scene where they're, by the way, just, like, having a Simon and Garfunkel in that song, and they're all, like, cuddling, <laughs> like, laying with each other and cu- petting a cat um in the dark and i'm like going, oh this is the world i want to live in where girls are just laying on each other's lap with cats with simon and garfunkel <laughs> in the background that's all i want but it was like oh that that like really kicked off the theme and the feels of the movie i thought like it set it the tone right away and i'm like i got it i know where this movie's going and i know i like it already like mm-hmm. this is it mm-hmm. yeah. okay so this was directed by james mangold yeah. which it did all right. It's fine. It was a movie about women, women but at least it man. passes the Bechdel test. Can you imagine if this was directed by a woman and done today? Oh my god! Like, I feel like this movie could have even more oh, of yeah. that sisterhood, even more of like building each other up. And I would be interested to see how they change some of the sexist shit that gets thrown around in here. And yeah, it's part of the memoir because it was part of her history, like part of her life that she had to deal with it. But like, how could we put today's lens on it? I would be so interested to watch that movie. Yeah, because this movie's what? Like, huh? Uh, uh, oh, shit. It's like uh, 20, it's 21 20 years, years old. 22? 21 years. Yeah. Um, it's it's a little bit younger than my sister. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, uh, so, I mean... That feels weird. Uh, <laughs> I know so old. I I have a I I love Whoopi Goldberg. Let me just preface this now. I like Whoopi Goldberg. I like all the roles that she plays. I did not like her in this movie, only because the the character that she plays, and I can't remember the nurse's name right now. Valerie. Valerie. Thank you. Um, you know, Valerie is mentioned in the book. Like when yes, we liked Valerie. Valerie took care of us, and that was all we pretty much got from it. Right. Other However, than a giant long braid. Yeah. Yes, they talk about her hair. <laughs> However, I felt like with the time period, it's 1999 and you've got Whoopi Goldberg and she had like the mystical Negro Yes, role they leaned into in it this. so hard. And I, I like when she is the black woman who knows everything and is going to set you straight, girl. And I'm just like, oh my God. Oh my God. Like, no, I just just be Valerie. Like, don't, I, I don't know. I didn't like the way she was written. It's not anything with Whoopi Goldberg. It's just well, And then, and then they lean into it with that bathtub scene where uh-huh. they make Winona Ryder as Susanna say horrible racist things to yep. her. Yeah. And then they blame it on her. She was having a moment with her, her mental illness. But like the whole point of the movie is, was she really ever mentally ill? So she was just saying racist things to this character. No, why were we leaning into that as an entire scene? 
No, well, it wasn't that, in the book. Yeah. It wasn't at all. That was completely She wasn't fabricated. even... Valerie was never black. mm She... There was nothing even remotely related to race one time that came up in the book. There wasn't one mention of anything. But they found a way. Racial. Yeah, like, how can we happen. throw racial slurs into here? Like, yeah. let's have a great time with that. Mm-hmm. No. It it's was, like... It was... You ever see those memes recently? I I like it where people are pointing out like villains in movies like Magneto and Killmonger uh, from uh, uh, Black Panther who are like going, these these characters really are kind of low-key making sense and have a point, but then you, like, the writers have to make them do something suddenly violent or suddenly racist or suddenly awful in order for you to be like, yes, that is the villain after all. Like... I felt like that's what they were doing with Susanna, especially like, oh yeah, she's not mentally ill, but until she says something racist, oh, well, she's mentally ill because she says something racist. And it's like, no, (laughs) like they did a lot of that in the movie. And Lisa too. Yeah. Lisa makes sense until she goes up and slaps uh, a girl because she turned on the light suddenly. Right. It's like, okay, you know what? (laughs) Like, Jesus, Uh, you you were making Lisa too likable, I guess. So you had to really cue that up. And it's like, hmm. This is less serious, but something that also is inconsistent between book and movie. You remember checks every the five cereal? minutes? No, oh, no, checks. no. The- <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing! Sorry. <laughs> I'm hungry. Oh Listeners, in in the book and in the movie, they both have it where the nurses would go around and make sure that everybody is doing okay. So they would open the door. and Oh, would, yeah. She describes it in the book so well, where it's just that you hear the whoosh of the door opening, checks, and then they count the people in the room, close the door, whoosh, and then they move on with their day. Okay, we had multiple scenes where the girls were missing. Missing! For, and like, like, hours. Checks. Where the fuck were checks? Like, what was that all about? Oh, she it? goes out for a cigarette for 20 minutes. Oh, okay. But that scene was clearly like an hour of them bowling and going to Dr. Right? Rick's office and reading their stuff and getting to the DSM-5. Like, whatever. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or, or there was there was one night, too, where like they do checks. And it was like in the middle of the night. And you can obviously see in the next bed that her roommate's not there. And I was sitting there going, wait, 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 wait. wait. Where's her roommate? And why was the nurse like not freaked out that it's like middle of the night, Susanna's sleeping? the fuck is a roommate? Like, I... So inconsistent. No. What? There were a lot of things in this movie where I was well, just like, this is... What are we doing here? Well, yeah, and also, that not no point in the book did any of the girls take off in the middle of the night to run through those underground tunnels together. Oh, and it specifically no. said in the book that the only way Susanna ever was able to do that was when a nurse went with her and, like, chaperoned her. I think so, that was added in to kind of show the the relationship of the girls mm-hmm. and like how how close they are and how bonded. I th- I mean, it definitely wasn't in the book, but I could see why they added it. You know, vibes. as a way to put in those medical records that you got oh. in between each chapter, yeah, and then we yeah. kind of got to like experience that when they were reading through. That their was file. good. That was a good way to uh, to put that put that backstory in. It was like Lisa just going through like, going, oh, this is what this uh, therapist thinks of you. Here's your file. Here's your file. And you're all reading it to like, as like a show and tell. <laughs> I thought that was, that was pretty good. That was pretty cool. I just yeah. wish they could have been consistent. But uh, you know, no, we that's... can't have everything, I guess. Mm, well. So one other thing that I found funny, which was depicted in the book and the movie, but in two very different ways, Ooh. was the man who shows up with this fancy car and tries to, like, whisk Susanna away. Where mm-hmm. in the book, it happens in, like, the first couple of chapters. She, like, just shows up to the hospital. She's not there very long. And some random man who we never even, like, figure out who this person even is. There's, like, no real description on, like, what history they have together. And he shows up and is like, what's up? This place sucks. Look out the window. There's my really cool car. Want to get out of here? Was that supposed She's like, to be what? the boyfriend who got drafted to Vietnam? I was like, yeah, we're going to Canada. Let's go. Well, that go. was him in the movie. Right. But in the book, but this it... was somebody who wasn't even her boyfriend. This was like a different man. Oh, and in the dude. movie, they played it off as like her boyfriend who also some... showed up and was like, let's hightail it to Canada. But like the irony that I'm thinking about, like, I guess it makes more sense with the boyfriend that he might do this because they have, like, a more 
personable relationship, I guess, even though they really didn't know each other very long. I think they hooked up, like, one time before she went to this yeah. hospital. Right. But in the book, like, there's no real, like, understanding of who this is. And so I'm thinking, like, what fucking guy drives over to the women's psych ward, yeah. calls up the girl he thinks is pretty hot, and is like, check out my sick Corvette, like, let's hightail it out of town and, like, go live the rest of our lives together. Like, Who's picking up chicks in the psych ward? I yeah. mean, hey, babe, you're cute. You want to get out of here? Like, like I'm busy. What? I'm so doing wheels stuff. wheels are outside. Wink, wink. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, God. and that's what I'm saying is, like, in the movie, he's saying to her, you aren't even sick. Like, you don't have problems. Like, you shouldn't be here. So, like, that would make more sense if, like, the understanding was, like, okay, she ended up here, but she maybe isn't mentally ill. She was just having, like, a dark period in her life. And so he's, like, let's get you the fuck out of here. You don't belong here. This place is a shithole. But in the book, which is the real world in which the story yeah. that happened, it's just some, like, guy. Like, I don't well, know who he is. Maybe, maybe that was, like, an error on Susanna's editor's part where it's obviously probably somebody Susanna knew and was just like, yeah, I wrote this in, like, that one time that happened that one day with this one guy and didn't really go into detail on her relationship with this person. And the editor was kind of like, yeah, that fits. That works. Let's just keep moving. It's like, you know, well, you yeah. could have asked her to, like... Maybe fill right. in those gaps. I don't know. Well, the <laughs> only thing we know about this man is he showed up to a psych ward one day and said, get in the car, we're leaving. <laughs> Actually, I think he might be the one who's a little bit off the deep end. <laughs> well, hey, you think hey. somebody just like, hey, you want to jump in my car? Like, ladies, fuck off, buddy. Ladies, do not yuck someone's yum, okay? <laughs> maybe he was just really into, maybe he like had the savior complex. Like, when I want to save these girls or whatever. Well, because and- remember when she finds out she has a visitor, her first thought is it's her old professor who she was having that affair with and so she's thinking oh my old boo thing is showing up to see me so cool and then she sees who it is and she's like oh fucking like tim from the bar like what are you doing here you know like she was like like what she was like what the fuck this is so random and then his response was like let's hightail it check out my sick vehicle and she's like nah i'm good and he's like all right peace out like, that was so weird. Like, that was the weirdest thing to me. It was really weird. Are, are you <laughs> mad that the movie, are you mad that the movie, like, kind of twisted that to expand upon it? Or no, did you want to keep I'm it to mo- keep it vague as well? I think I'm just more wondering okay. if, like, because it was so common during this time for women to be admitted to hospitals, mm-hmm. like... Were there men looking for women, like for wives and shit? Oh They're God. like searching the the hospitals or what? Because hey. that was kind of the way that she got out. Was the reason that she was able to leave? Because she in got the married. Book, which because yes. she had a marriage proposal. Oh my yes. God! Don't forget, ladies, you're only worth as what uh, as much as a man who will put a ring on your finger says you're worth. So if if a man wants to put a finger on that. You're all set. He wants to put yes. a finger on that? He wants to put Wait, a finger on that ring. ring on that. He wants to put a finger <laughs> on that ring. Second. That's a completely <laughs> different show. I did not realize. Okay. <laughs> I have to wonder. Sometimes they were a little bit uh, blasé about how, oh, yeah, and Susanna was promiscuous. Oh, Susanna had right? boyfriends. Oh, my God. The fact that she had boyfriends at all was, yep. I think, the reason they were saying promiscuous. Also, Well, she had whatever, boyfriends get and it, she girl. slept with them. Whore. Whore. Oh so, my god. Like, I have to wonder if this guy was just from the book. The reason that he didn't make any impression was because she was just like, I don't know, boys are entertaining. I'll just like <laughs> whatever. Yeah. They're all whatever to me. Probably. Yeah, she could have yeah. been a, a fling that she had. Yeah. Um, but I do think it's interesting though how like most of the women were very like vocal when they were talking about sex. Like I remember there was a ta- the time where they were all saying like when your, you know, little boo thing outside comes and visits, how long can you guys get laid? Like, we have a five minute check. Can you get it done in four and a half minutes? I know. Like, oh, I, love I can get it. I can get it done in one and a half minutes. And so they're all like teaming up on each other. Like, who can bang the fastest? <laughs> and then so they're all very just like vocal and cool about like sexuality. And yeah. so in the time period. Was that weird? Like, was in it the a- 60s? Uh, probably. Yeah. I don't so know. So I do think. Uh, I, I don't, I don't think know either. so, because that's the thing. It's like, we were never allowed to talk about it, but just like, you know, women in their Tupperware parties, you don't know what's being said there. By Tupperware parties, I mean, yeah, yeah let's just pretend to 
sell Tupperware while we're like, what? Yeah. And then my husband did let me finish the other night. And oh, let me tell you. Oh. And it's like, yeah. So again, I wouldn't. I think they were. I think they were all dirty in the sixties too. It just like they were just around it, women constantly. They didn't need to be. They didn't need to be demure and pff, fuck that. It is crazy though, M. How you said you made the point that she only did get out when she had a marriage proposal, and that is very alarming. very the sixties because Ugh. okay in. This was one of the parts in the movie that I actually think helped explain some of the situation that happened in the book in a way that was digestible. Like, it was easy to grasp. The guy at the bar who said, oh yeah, my friend went to a mental institution for a little while. He saw purple people. Do you see purple people? And she's like, no, I do not. Wait, did he get better? Did he stop seeing the purple people though? Oh no, he still sees them. He just stopped telling everybody else about it. And so that's how he was able to recover and get out. Yeah. And I think that that plays a big part of it. Where, like, she still has all of the same feelings about herself and her life. But she has just stopped making it the thing that she talks about to other people. Mm -hmm. And she just continued to move on with her life. Well, also, like, you know, you you take into account that Susanna did try to commit suicide. Like that was in the book and that was in the Mm -hmm. movie. She, she tried to take a bottle of aspirin, um, but everything, but even, even around her suicide, right. It was still like other people, her parents especially uh, saw her aimless. She, she didn't, she didn't have a, she didn't have goals in life. And that was weird. And that was like, so she was depressed obviously, because, you know, she, she was going through something. She, it was a transition in her life where she's like, no one believes in her, but she doesn't know what she wants to do. So she freaks out. Totally understandable. But like, I think it was more than just the suicide attempt. It was the fact that she liked to write and she would rather stay up in her room than mingle at a fucking dry, uh, like a boring cocktail party girl, same. And it's like, oh, and yeah, I like, she was just different. Yeah. It was just, well, she just didn't, prescribe herself to whatever image they wanted right she just did her own thing how dare you have a personality well and she didn't want to go to college she didn't want to go to college she wanted to write which is like that was like the biggest upset of everybody it was like why aren't you going to college everybody's going to college this girl's daughter that girl's daughter only to go to get married by the way it was like just to go to get your mrs degree anyway so it's like and then every time anybody asked her what did she want to do with her life and she said i want to be a writer they were like no but like what do you actually want to do to make money and she's like i want to be a writer and they're like Ew. Funny and how like sixty years later that still concerned. hasn't changed. <laughs> well, she wrote. We I know she book. did, but Turn that, that a opi- fucking movie. That opinion of people still hasn't changed, right? People don't want to go to college now. Everyone's like, oh, like what do you do with your I life? Know. Well, I want to be a writer. Uh, but what do you really want to do for real? It still hasn't changed sixty years later, which is so depressing. But also, you remember that scene? It was her graduation in the movie where she falls asleep during her ceremony, which again, girl, yeah. same. I would have done it as well. Um, but when well, they were like naming the people and they're like, well, yes, they were the part of the French club and national honor society and like naming all the, the, a cop, like going to this college, going to going this to college. And it was like, Susanna Kaysen, no clubs, no college. That's like, she's the yeah. most interesting person there. I think it's like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> she's just Susanna Kaysen. You don't need to fluff that up. Like, <laughs> oh my God. What about Jared Leto? Yeah, Jared oh, Leto Jared. was Toby, <laughs> the guy who came and, like, tried to get her to hop in there in the car. Yeah, in the car. I, like, missed that, but then I remember he was the one that, like, saw her when she fell asleep in the graduation, and he, like, saw her at a party after that and was like, hey, I saw you sleeping at the graduation, that was pretty funny or something. Yeah. But Jared Leto. Jared what Leto. What an interesting character. I mean, Jared Leto himself is an interesting character, so. Right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, there is that. <laughs> So there was one part in the movie that I absolutely flipped my shit. I might have yelled at my TV a little bit. And it wasn't in the book. It was just after we decided that Lisa was now a sociopath and it was worthwhile to make her the full-on villain. And the most villainous thing that she did was don't rob a woman who's literally hanging in front of you. Like, the money in her robe. Why did she keep money in her robe, first of all? Second of all, literally just, like, looting a dead body before she runs off the scene to just get out of there before the cops arrive. She doesn't need it. What the 
That whole scene didn't make sense. Okay, sure. No, no Susanna, it was just there to make Daisy, Lisa fine. the villain. Yeah. The money would not have been in the robe. Lisa would not have just like searched the body like that. She probably would have searched the house, the apartment. Right. But not the body. Yeah, because know. when I see people in robes walking around their house, the first thing I'm like, yes, you must be storing some hundreds in uh, those pockets. <laughs> there were so many times this movie was unbelievable. I uh, enjoyed yeah. it. I thought it was more entertaining than the book. But man, there were parts that were just like very unbelievable. Yeah, well, and that's what pisses me off because it's like Lisa was a real human being and you're... Yeah saying she did these things that she never did and this never even happened. Like, that's not okay. Like, I feel like when you make a movie from a book and the book is, you know, fiction. Yeah. You can do it really kind of, uh, I mean, you can really spin it more, right? Or not? Actually, uh, there's a fun, a fun fact. Uh, Amanda Knox is actually going through this problem right now because I was listening to, she was guest starring on another podcast and uh, talking about her time. If, if you don't know who Amanda Knox is, she was yeah. the, yeah. Emily, you know who she was, right? Remind me. Okay, so she was the one who uh, who was charged with her boyfriend's murder in Italy um, her boyfriend and her roommate, right? Or yeah. something. No, no, only her roommate. Only it her was roommate. Her boyfriend and her that were charged, charged. for it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I kind of vaguely remember this. She went to the jail. Mid- yeah, she went to jail. She went to jail, and jail she... for like six years or something? Four Ooh. years? Yeah. Oh, and in Italy. In, mid, in mid, Italy. Mid aughts. Yeah. And uh, I, I remember kind of vaguely the story, but I didn't follow it well. But anyway, she was like cleared. Of these charges, by the way. But right now, there's a movie that, that just came out recently called Still Water with Matt Damon. And that is very loosely based on is it? Amanda Knox's story. And Amanda Knox mentioned, she's like, well, I, I didn't approve this. I don't want it. But, like, it's not, you know, it's it's fiction, technically. But they totally pulled from her. And she was mentioning how she, she like, wrote to Matt Damon. She's like, well, look, I don't. It's fine if you want to use me as an inspiration for your story, but like, you know, and they never responded back to her, but she's, she's a little miffed about it, but I don't think she has any legal recourse. And I think the same with that Lisa, because you can easily argue, well, that's a different Lisa. This is like loosely. I feel mm -hmm. like you can't because the Mm -hmm. movie is the same name as the book. It's the same exact Susanna Kaysen character who's the author of the book. It's all the same characters. It's the exact story. I don't think it'll hold up. Stillwater, I'm looking at it, it's a man who goes to France and he has a daughter and he's in prison. Mm-hmm. But, like, it's not, like, a girl who's in college and killed her root. It's, like, a totally different story. It's totally different story. And if you notice, based on true or inspired by true events. I think that's what it's like, says in its tagline because they took that from Amanda Knox unabashedly. Whoa. The Amanda Knox wow. story. So it's like... Oh, oh I gosh. do see that loosely based, based on Amanda on, Knox story. There it Whoa. is. Yeah. Loosely. And so Amanda, Amanda That's was like, I am not cool with that. But she doesn't have any legal recourse. But she she's a very intelligent and interesting woman to listen to. Like, I love listening to her. And like, especially in this past interview. I was like, well, you know, I really did need to dig down this Amanda Knox, uh, Knox rabbit hole. I never, like, paid... I... I Saw her story here and there. Never followed it. Maybe I should start. Yeah, I just... God. But anyway, that's... The point is, is like... Like Amanda Knox, even if Lisa was alive and had an issue with it, I don't think she had any legal recourse to say... Because the movie could just say, well, I mean, it's inspired. It's based by... It's not... It doesn't have to be word for word. Like, you know, it's a fictionalized account of Susanna Kaysen's autobi- yeah, autobiography. That's so. right. Oh. All right. Is there a scene from this movie that you love, love, loved? If so, what was that scene for you? Hmm. Oh, honestly, the ice cream scene for me. Like, I just thought it was the funniest thing ever. When they all go, and this was in the book as well, but they kind of made it a little different in the movie. But, you know, the their big field trip is as a group, they all get to go to this ice cream shop together and they're the crazy girls showing up to the ice cream shop and everybody always gets alarmed because they're like barking out things and hissing and doing all kinds of wild stuff, which they 
I can't remember if they said this in the book, but they did in the movie. Like, they almost, like, intentionally do it because, like, people know they're there from the local women's hospital. So why and, like, not? So often like, do they get to just, like, be out right? and do the thing? And, and so they're lean like, in. The- these people are already judging us, so let's just be yeah. extra to just, like, l- you know, lean into it. Um, mm-hmm. But in the movie, they have that woman that approaches Susanna and, like, cusses her out. I mean, she doesn't really, but she, like, calls her out. Which also, like, yeah. the balls. Weird. Like, you would think if you saw her with all her psych ward girls, you the last thing you do is approach her. You just, like, hustle out the back and hide without hoping she'd see you. But she sh- got some balls on her and tried to call her out and make, you know, say, like, screw you for screwing my husband. And the whole girl pack just pounced and arf, hissed and arf. clawed. Yeah. And oh, my God. It was the so funniest fun. thing ever. Oh, it was so good. <laughs> was this an early version of Karen? Was this like <laughs> was I thought Karen, Karen. Karen? I thought Karen would have yes. said, like, "Oh my god, no, it's Karen!" It was so good. Yes. I love that, that was scene. a Karen moment. Hilarious. Yeah, I mean, there were so many uh, scenes that I loved, like the time where they were helping Polly when they were playing the music. Loved that. I loved too when um, she finally Susanna leaves the war the the psych ward for like ever, and she gives Polly the cat that was Daisy's. Oh, yeah. Polly is so happy to like be gifted this kitten like just so sweet but yeah the ice cream scene was the funniest by the way great cat acting by the way right? that like, cat was amazing how so much patient. that cat was handled and they're like on set like whew, good good kitty <laughs> like good, good kitty, kitty. Yeah. there was one scene that was just such a small little thing but it was such a pact of sisterhood where Lisa was intentionally getting in front of the li- the nurse doing checks, trying to prevent oh, them yeah. from getting yeah. into... How's your boyfriend? How's your fiance? When she had a boyfriend in her room, yeah. just, like, giving her a few more seconds <laughs> of just, like, fucking around. Oh, so good. Again. What a sister move. Lisa. Love it. Well, and that was another moment where they showed Lisa in a good light, where yeah. she was, like, helping her friends and, like, doing them a solid and, like, taking the hit for it. Because remember they got... Remember she held that, like, pen in her neck and was like, I'm going to shove this through my neck. I'm going to get it! <laughs> she wasn't going to. And then, uh, yeah. I remember seeing that in the trailer, like, way back when, in 1998. <laughs> yeah, she tried to pull a crazy girl move to keep them from going Valerie the called her out on it, too. It's like, going, uh-uh, that, that's in your stomach. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, right. Uh. <laughs> um, so I loved all of the scenes that you guys mentioned. They were perfect. But I think the one that really called out to me, um, and, and, and uh, I... It's me. It was me. It's like when when uh, Susanna comes in and meets her roommate for the first time, and her roommate is reading the the girl with the plaid skirt or the whatever. Oh. Like it's the second book in the Wizard of Oz, right? And she's sitting there. And she also has like books piled on her uh, desk uh, with her on her bed. It's like, oh hi, me. If I'm gonna be stuck in a mental institution. What am I going to do? Yeah. Uh, And then she like asked Susanna, her roommate asked Susanna, she's like, have you read it? And Susanna's like, well, I've seen the movie. No, but I've seen the movie. And her roommate's like, no, no, no. The the movie was all like the first book, but this is like something different. And she starts discussing like, what's the difference? And Susanna's like, attention gone. Like, doesn't even. Immediately checked out. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God, it's me. (laughs) I'm the first I've seen her going, well, uh, let me tell you what's different. (laughs) Oh, it is you. You found yourself in the movie. Yeah, I found me. <laughs> well, and yeah. of course, the reason why her attention is reverted or drawn away is because Lisa's being brought home from yeah. having escaped the the ward. So oh, she's yeah. in her stealing stealing the spotlight in that moment because she's now being brought through like up in a police car. She's like oh, real God. wild and out like a stray cat. Wait, did you feel like also because like. The Susanna brings up in the book that uh, Susanna escaped a lot. Like, she would just leave for a couple weeks or a week and then just come you back. You Lisa, on... right? Lisa. Lisa. Sorry, what did I say? Susanna. So, oh, well, Susanna said in the book, yeah, sorry, that Lisa would, like, leave for a couple weeks or a week or whatever and then just come back. And so you didn't really see it that often. It was like, yeah, Lisa was brought back that one time. And then she well, and Susanna ran away that yeah. one time. But it was like a regular thing with Lisa. She was just like, I'm sick of this place. I'm going to leave. And then she comes and she goes, yeah, I was sick of the other world. So I came back. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Wish they did Lisa more that. was just a free spirit. She was just living however she could. You know. Yeah. You know, there was one. It's so funny because I, I had started reading the book. I read like 50 pages. And then like 
I didn't read it again for like two weeks straight. <laughs> And I, I, like, then I, like, picked it back on. I'm like, shit, it's been so long. I'm going to just, like, reread what I already read because now I'm going to, like, fire through it. And I was reading, like, the first 50 pages a second time. And I went into my notes to jot down a note. And it was already there from the first time that I read uh. it. <laughs> Which I was like, oh, my God, that's hilarious. <laughs> Great mind. That our right? same oh mind. The deja yeah. vu moment. Right? I'm like, how funny you already wrote this down. <laughs> and it was just this description that Susanna gave to being mentally ill in her perspective, whether she was or wasn't. And I, I just, it was just so powerful to me. She described her psychotic break as a parallel universe. And, like, the first couple chapters of the book, she brings up this topic of parallel universe, like, several times to describe, like, mental health issues. And, like, apparently that really struck a chord with me because I wrote it down two separate times. But I was thinking about it because it's, like, that's such an interesting way to look at that. I mean, are we not also because that also... It was was COVID also doesn't that feel like a parallel universe? Like it's just, this is its own separate time where time almost means nothing. And you're kind of thinking, well, I mean, I feel that like this is a weird moment in her life and it doesn't feel like it fits in with her other timeline. So it's its own parallel universe. And I'm, I'm feeling it right well, now in the past year yeah. and a half. Also, but- well, also in the fact that like, it's a parallel universe to her and all these women here in this hospital because they're living this world that they're in, but, like, everybody else is just moving on without them. Yeah. And it's, like, their worlds couldn't be any more different and polar opposite. And it's just a strange concept to think that, like, life is existing and happening and going on and on and on, and they're stuck in this, like, other world, and they're, like, trying to like make like amends with it but then the other thing she mentioned during the same couple of chapters in the book was she had also brought up the fact that reminded me of something I've learned about people who are imprisoned which I've heard through several podcasts and other books I've read is that like once you're in that environment you're comfortable with it because like you're used to being taken care of and you're used to being like, you don't, you don't have to do jack shit, you know? The whole day is fucking aligned out. Point A, B, C, D throughout the whole day. All you have to do is breathe the air and everybody else is, like, micromanaging everything from the minute you wake up to your first snack to every pill you're having and one minute you got to do this and blah, blah, blah. And they get so, like, caught up into this groove that they feel like it's so much easier to just continue existing in that world than having to go out into the real world and, like, figure it out themselves which for Susanna's point like she wasn't able to fi- like she felt like she couldn't figure it out she felt like she was the oddball she didn't want to go to school no one took her career path seriously she was like her didn't fit in with her parents and all their friends and like she was just like in a weird vibe and so every in that real world everyone was telling her you're wrong you're wrong you're wrong and so was it easier to just be in this hospital where, sure, she might have still been wrong, but, like, things were easier. It was structured for was her. Structured. She didn't have to think about it. She didn't have to create the path. The path was just laid out before her. It's probably it would be easy. assisted in helping her get better, or at least not get better, like, you know, just, like. Get herself to a point where yeah. she felt comfortable, comfortable creating that structure for mm-hmm. herself. Yeah. yeah. Jordan That's makes note so of, like, maybe doing the Shawshank Redemption next season, now that uh, Melissa's brought that up. So anyway, go on. Oh, Shawshank goodness. Redemption. Yeah. There, there's a heavy I one. I don't know. I just thought that, like, interesting, this concept of the parallel universe, and then this idea of, like, not mental health institutions today, although I can't speak to them because I don't know anything about them or anybody in them, but in mm-hmm. this story specifically, and the women that were in this story... Some definitely probably needed to be there. Maybe others didn't. But this idea of, like, like the correlation between some of the people in this hospital as well as people that are in criminalized, like, in prisons. Like, is there – can we, like, relate this same appeal of feeling like you can't cope out in the regular world and so it's better to be in the parallel world where people are helping you cope through it step by step and life's easier? I don't know. That's interesting. I really like that. That's something I'll have to mull over because 
who knows? Who knows what the real answer is? If you know, it could be different for every single person, but it definitely that's what they were trying to set up with these institutions mm-hmm. was let's give you you can't play in the real world, so we'll do parallel play for a little while. You know, right? Like, yeah. Well, they even say in the like, you know, right after she shows up to this hospital, she wants to leave, and they're like, "Sorry, you're not going anywhere." You signed, like, yourself you signed yourself in. You signed yourself in. Well, she's like, "I'm an adult. I brought myself here. I couldn't take myself out." And they're like, "No, wow. you brought yourself here, and now it's up to us to decide when you're able you to leave." You signed over your rights to us. Right? When you signed yourself I in. Hate that. So we see in the movie more than the book, because it's not as heavily described in the book, but she's just kind of like a bat out of hell for like the first, you know, year and a half until after the Daisy suicide. And then she like cracks into gear and decides to follow the rules and follow the instructions and play the game. And then she's like released like a few months later. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know. Like, Uh, it really bothers me that. The, the big bad for me was evident in the book. And the big bad was the system itself. The, system. the fact that w- yep. women, if they had any kind of personality or thought process or desire that was outside of what was regulated or deemed normal or consistent with whatever ideal they wanted for this woman, then she could have just gotten chucked into this institution. So it was the system. The system was the big bad. The idea, but that's too nebulous, right? Well, well, so they well, had to give her a catalyst. That had to be Lisa. That had to be Daisy's death. She couldn't deal with the idea of her own death, really, until she saw another dead body, literally. Right. And it, that it, was the catalyst, I guess. And but that it was, was dumb because th- it was already there. That that was the reason for my low score when it when it really comes down to yeah. it uh, was the the ending right because and and I'm torn about it because my, m- one of the my biggest takeaways from the book was about the system and uh, commentary on the system and women who yes. actually do have problems but then the movie kind of veered its way into well Daisy's death was a catalyst for uh, Susanna to kind of get herself in order and to look at therapy as a tool and to work harder on herself and to um, actually um, better herself, which I'm not against. I'm glad that the movie also had that message, but that wasn't the original message of the book. That's not what I got from the book. So that was where I'm like, I don't like where the movie went as far as the time era, like what the message really was, but also I'm not going to condemn a movie for saying maybe you should go to therapy and work on your shit, right? Like it's there's no shame in that. Work on your shit. Talk to your therapist. Like, you know, that's fine. There's no shame. And so yeah, I can't fault the movie, but that's not what that was like. Mm, yeah. It wasn't it wasn't what the book was trying to convey. Exactly. Yeah. And I think so. that lack of loyalty to its source material is did kind of it changed the outcome of the movie yeah. in a way that wasn't necessarily for the better. I think mm-hmm. the movie was more entertaining than the book at times, mm. but I think that the book was so honest that I like it more. It was totally. very raw. Just, yeah. yeah. Um, so speaking, as I said, speaking of ratings, like I rated it the lowest. I gave it like a 70 out of a hundred based on adaptations. And that was mostly because of the ending and where it went. But again, I can't fault it for, giving you the message that therapy right. is good, sisterhood is great, uh, be friends with your fellow girls, like, that's not a Those bad message. Those are all message. good messages. Yeah, but it's like, the book was also in its own right a really good memoir that everybody, I think, should read. It just didn't convey that message. So mm-hmm. that's where I was. Melissa, M, what, what do you, like, what about your ratings? Well, my thought is that if they made a movie exactly exactly a replica to the book it would be like what <laughs> right, <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, yeah what probably, did i just probably. see like i have no idea what i'm looking at none of this makes sense it's all twisted up when did this happen when did that happen blah blah blah. who are these people how do they cl-? like i felt like there were parts of the book that like were so out of left field there was literally one chapter where i ended the chapter saying i have no idea what i just read <laughs> like, I, don't have a, I don't have the slightest clue as to a single sentence that was in this entire chapter and I didn't. I had no clue. I'm like, I don't know what the hell this was. And there were times where when I was reading it where I thought to myself, like, I almost feel like the girl in the hospital is writing this and this is what I'm reading. Because mm-hmm. it's kind of like 
parts of it were a little like jarbled and chaotic and like uh, very not ADD, like right that's what i thought ADD. when it was like jumping back and forth yeah. between blah, blah, timelines blah, 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 and, like yeah. so many different thoughts happening that like sporadically that didn't all really like blend cohesively and then there were like a, ch- a whole chapter i was like i don't even know what you said <laughs> um so i was like thinking like there's no way a movie could portray this perfectly and be successful because the book is a little like out of like a little chaotic at least for that's how I interpret it reading it I very much enjoyed it but I also there were times where I'm like I don't know what's going on um so I appreciated that like the book added in a, or the movie added in a little more jazz to kind of like fill in these gaps that I felt like maybe we're missing in the book but I feel like now we've like had our conversation there is like points now that I want to pull back specifically in our first uh, section where was it true to the book and the last number four is the depth true to the author's intention where I gave it like a really high score and now I'm kind of feeling like I need to bring that back down to like a five <laughs> instead of a nine but you're still um, like in the low 80s if that is the case so you still rated yeah, it like rather high I did which is because yeah and I think that like I do still read it high I'm reading it like in the eight whether it's like eight low 80s or high 80s, but somewhere in the 80s out of 100. I think just, like, because as a whole, I think whether it's the book or the movie, like, the messages that are coming across, I think, are great and, like, good for people to, like, have access to and visibility mm-hmm. to. Mm-hmm. Um, So I don't feel like the book is hurting – or, I'm sorry, the movie is, like, hurting anything or f- messing up with people's thoughts or perspectives – and, in, and like I said, when we started the episode, like, the book was kind of gnarly. <laughs> so maybe in order to, like, get this message out, they had to tone it down in certain areas for the general population to be able to, like, hear it and see it and, like, feel okay with, like, it without, like, walking away and, like, being traumatized. <laughs> yeah. There were just, like, I think part of, like, the language in the book was, like, a little extreme at times. I don't know. There were certain parts where I was like, shit, this is kind of like heavy. <laughs> I didn't feel that as much in the movie other than when Daisy died. That was like the heaviest part for me. Yeah. It is also okay to rate a little bit higher on movies that have nostalgia factor from your team. Right. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Totally yes. Like, we yeah. don't have to even. <laughs> well, and also when I rewatched this, which I hadn't seen it in like 10 years. I mean, I watched it 3000 yeah. times in the early 2000s and like it's been so long and I still loved it. I mean, <laughs> I like, it still yes. holds up. Which is great, right? I was still, like, obsessed with it. But it was really great to now, at this period in my life, read the book, see the real story, who it came from, the real words from the real author, and just be like, wow, you know, the movie was great, and it, like, did a lot for me, especially as a youth. But now I'm seeing, like, the rawness of this, and it, like, hits really heavy. And if I had read this in high school... I don't know if, like, it would have been as good for me as, like, seeing this movie. Right. Uh, uh, by the way, Emily and I just give, like, so much leeway to previous adaptations if they have a nostalgia factor. Like, uh, Matilda <laughs> and, like, The Princess Bride got really high marks for their movie because we're like, yes, this was my childhood. Oh, so I yes. love Matilda. Oh, my God. It's, like, the best movie ever. So we absolutely yeah. have a nostalgia factor. It's right. okay. There's a bell curve. We're not even mad. <laughs> no, it's fine. Emily, what about you? You're you're like in the middle. You're between us. I landed somewhere in the middle. I gave it a 76. And I think that you're right. This movie does bring a lot of great themes that I think the book wanted to portray. And the book is so dry. It is so matter of fact. But it is so interesting. It is so honest mm-hmm. and raw, like we talked about. That I, I love it. I think that... There could have been a little bit more fidelity, especially towards the end of the movie, Mm -hmm. to its original source material. We didn't Mm -hmm. need to ramp up Lisa's character in that way. We didn't need to have a lot of things, like in the tunnels and the way that the girls yeah, broke out. No, the inconsistencies. We, we could have skipped the bowling. Like, there were things that could have <laughs> not like been included. <laughs> it was cute. It was very yeah, entertaining. Yeah. That was one add-on I didn't buy. Yeah. <laughs> So I think it was good. As an adaptation goes, it's not terrible. No, it's I'll fine. Give it a C. Middle of the it's road. It's C skip degrees, right? That's like, right. It's, That's it, what we it, say. It's it's ad- it did it did adequately adequately well. Uh, but by the way, critics like didn't like this movie. They, Rotten Tomatoes oh, really? has it at a fifty three percent. 
Oh, no way. But the so guys, a movie about women taking oh control God. of their own mental health and breaking the mold? How dare they? But the audience score was, like, in the mid-80s. So, oh, like, really? yeah. yeah, they, uh... Yeah, critics, like, I guess really shat on it, but, uh, I wouldn't... Well, I would the critics a... of 1999? Yeah, who are the critics? Fuck off. I don't know. Roger Whatever. and Ebert? Whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Like, it's the 90s. I'm... Whatever was on the VHS uh, sleeve. Right? Oh, oh, oh I remember that. Whoever was writing for the New York Times and the Washington mm-hmm. Post in that time and, like, did the movie reviews. Take out those blurbs. Oh, yeah. it's about women. Oh, it's about Ugh. women having emotions and It's feelings. about women and Ugh. mental health. Ew. Ew. Right? Wow. So I'm not surprised the critic score is so low. I think it's fucked up. And I'll go with the audience score on this yeah, one. Yeah, audience fine. score, definitely. Especially since, it, like, like I said... I knew a lot of women who loved this movie, and it stuck with them. Obviously, Melissa, hi. Uh, like essential, essential uh-huh. reading, essential watching. I don't even care whichever one you do. It's good. I don't know. And I great, guess great I always thought it was going to be like maybe darker. Like it is dark. Don't get me wrong, but I always thought yeah. like the movie was a little, was going to be way more darker because I was a very sheltered child, and the rated R was like, oh my god, it's rated R, and it has Angelina Jolie in it, and they say fuck a lot, like. Oh, Aww, sweet BB. But the one, but the one yeah. scene I did actually see, like, because it was on TV, and I had started watching it, was the Daisy scene. Oh God! Oh, so, like, That's that horrible. was my first scene I ever saw this movie, and then I was like, "Yeah, this is dark. I'm going to leave now." Like, that mm. was. Well, so. and you know, I feel like on the flip side, I grew up in like complete and total chaos. So, like, for me, I like could like this was like a great like god's grace like being able to see young girls that like were effed yes. up and mm-hmm. like seeing most of them in like you know like they were likable i mean we liked yeah. these characters yep. like they were cool girls and i liked them together as like this one big pack of like wild wolves and so it like it kind of empowered me a little bit the slither in me the slither in me I'm respected okay. lisa so ho- so much like i'm like going, yes right? lisa yes also, and to your point, like, they had a chaotic lifestyle in, while they were living in the ward, but then, like, someone gets out, and it ties up in a neat little bow. Right? There is hope for at the end of this yes. tunnel, and so that had to have been nice to see as a kid, too, to know that, yeah, you can have these issues, these doubts, and you'll still have hope at the end. But also see that you aren't just it, because look at all these other characters here who are real people and lived these lives and experienced these things, and it's so diverse and different, but at the end, they're all kind of suffering through the same kind of thing and can, like, connect and relate to each other on that level. Yeah. And I feel like when I was a kid, I didn't have, I didn't know any other girl that was, like, suffering, because we weren't talking about that. No, right. we weren't like, allowed to we're, talk we're about We're playing it. dolls, and we were at the playground, we are playing soccer, we were talking about the hardship happening at home. Mm-hmm. We weren't, like, you were, sometimes you didn't even know what was happening, because it was just normal. Yep. You didn't even yeah. know it was different. But then you get older, and you're like, whoa, holy <laughs> shit. Yeah, that was, that? that was How fucked up. okay? Yeah. Right? <laughs> oh. And so I feel like this movie, like, portrays a bunch of women that have, were dealing with so many obstacles, whatever they were, and it was just a reminder like, for, like, people like me that, like, oh, my God, I'm not alone in the craziness of life, and I also might not be crazy, I also might be. <laughs> like, like, we don't know. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. But like, I Just like remember, the, uh, this. Go to therapy when you need to. Talk it out. Or even when you exactly. don't need to. It's always, always, yeah, always good to go exactly. see a therapist. Like, therapy rules. So, oh, it's I my love favorite it. thing on earth. It's the best thing ever. So, what a great conversation, gals. Um, I, I know. know we have a drinking game with this one. And I think you're do. all going to need it yeah. to go yes. with either the book or the movie. Uh, get put on that liver transplant list, ladies. We're getting ready to go. Um, <laughs> Am, what's our drinking game? Uh, we're going to need you all to take a drink when you see Susanna writing in her journal. <laughs> or you hear about Susanna writing in her journal as, in the book, you know. Hint, she, she writes talks a lot. About it. Yeah. She does. Uh, so sorry about this in the movie. Take a drink whenever anyone lights a cigarette. <laughs> which is like every other scene. So have some Six water scenes, handy. Man. Yeah. Remember hey. to hydrate. Hail, Hail hydrate. hydrate. <laughs> Uh, take a drink whenever you side eye a therapy or a diagnosis that just seems questionable with a 2021 lens. 
Because mm. for real, a lot of these things, like in the 60s, homosexuality was in the DSM. Oh, right, right. Just, Wasn't one of the girls in there, the reason she was in there, because as Lisa put it, she was a dyke. <laughs> You're dyke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like, oh, this is abnormal. We're going to throw you in the mental institution. Like, no, that's just, oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, yeah. Take a drink anytime someone is painting their nails, <laughs> which is kind of loving in its own way. It's weird, but they do that a lot in this one. And then take a drink anytime you question whether or not Susanna is actually a reliable narrator or not. Hmm. So that's for the the book peeps who just want to be pure yes. bookists. Um, yeah. Um, also, take two drinks whenever Polly is called Torch. Because <laughs> it's just mean, but also... It's so mean. Okay, so I don't mean. remember if Polly's situation is the same from book to movie. It is. Is that what she, happened to she her set, in the book? She yes. set herself on fire. Yes. I must have... With a gasoline can. Yep. It was the, but, fir- but it was the first chapter. It was the very... That's yeah. one, like, it stuck me. I'm like, going, holy shit, this girl set herself but on fire. I'm in. Like, it's they, real. They switched up the why. In yeah. the book, they said it was... They didn't say why, I don't think. But in the mm. movie, they said it was because her she was allergic to her puppy and her puppy gave her rashes, so she wanted to set her skin on fire. Because her, her parents said, we're going to give away your puppy because it gave you a rash, so she wanted to burn off her rash. Like, I don't have, have a rash puppy. anymore. Right. Oh my god, it makes so much more sense why she loved, loved, loved the that cat. Cow. Exactly. Yes. Oh. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It's coming together, you guys. It's like, <laughs> it was like it was meant to be. Uh, but yeah, they called her Torch, which is torch. horrible. It's <laughs> just horrible. That was mostly so Lisa, horrible. right? Mostly Did Lisa. Yeah, mostly yeah. Her? No, okay. it was Lisa. It was whatever Lisa called her Torch, really. God. Um, so this was a very interesting read and a really good movie, um, despite what m- I may have said. Um, so go check it out, listeners. Um, Melissa, thank you so much for bringing this to us. Yes, this was amazing. Of course. So, never too dark. It's fine. No. Okay. I was <laughs> we, like, whoa. We, we, we've done some pretty dark ones in the past. So you try making it funny when you're talking about The Handmaid's Tale. Okay. Like, okay, okay, cool. I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> you're fine. Um. Yeah, listeners, thank you so much for coming back to us. And, like, we're excited to kick off this new season. Em and I have a ton of great um, adaptations that we're going to be covering this season. Um, but we want to hear from you. Uh, we have an email address. It's a novel adaptation at gmail.com. And, by the way, at another episode, we did get um, – a response back because remember em we did a call to uh, call to action for some romance listeners when we did a walk to remember oh my god somebody gosh, actually yes. responded so at our next episode we're going to discuss uh, uh uh a romance uh aficionado or uh uh yeah uh take on what we thought of a, a walk to remember and that genre Ooh. so yeah i can't wait to discuss that but um and but we want to hear from you also let us know what you thought of girl interrupted did it stick with you did you love it did uh have you never did you realize it was even a book at all i don't know if I didn't. you have any law experience that deals with the intellectual property, property and how we it need, goes from book to movie if they have any it. rights yeah <laughs> so uh we responded to those emails within a day or so uh, but yeah just let us know and we also have a twitter account we're on there a lot, so novel adaptation. Perfect, Well, perfect. thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me, and I just loved everything about the book, the movie, this conversation. It's All of it was amazing, so thank you guys so much for inviting me on and for letting me pick this book and just talking about amazing women um, with a little bit of problems, but they're still great. I mean, that's your bread and butter, right? <laughs> yeah, it really is. That, like, is it surprising I picked this book of all books? Not at all. No. <laughs> you know, it's making more and more sense the more we talk. Right? Yep. Yep. Love it. <laughs>